God has been moving this year. It's already the fourth week, or should I say it's only the fourth week. God has done so much. It feels like the 44th week, but it's only week four of 2022. We've been in a crazy series called Infinite. We're gonna continue in that today. So go ahead, grab your Bibles out with me. Open up to 1 Kings. This is where I wanna start our time together in 1 Kings. I'm gonna go to uh, specifically to chapter 18. Because in chapter 18, we have got, for context, the situation that revolves around Elijah, who has just come off one of the most epic and dynamic showdowns that you're gonna find in the entire Bible between himself and the prophets of Baal, where, where God shows up powerfully and not only does God consume the fire and the, the sacrifice with fire in a, in a dramatic fashion, but, but Elijah himself, like a savage prophet, kills over 850 false prophets of Baal and Asherah with his bare hands. It's the kind of prophet you listen to. It says this in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 41. It says, Then Elijah said to Ahab, Go get something to eat and drink, for I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. So Ahab went to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel and bowed low to the ground and prayed with his face between his knees. And then he said, His servant, go and look toward the sea. The servant went and looked, then returned to Elijah and said, I didn't, I didn't see anything. Seven times Elijah told him to go and look. Finally, the seventh time, his servant told him, I saw, I saw a little cloud about the size of a man's hand rising from the sea. Then Elijah shouted, hurry to Ahab and tell him, climb into your chariot and go back home. If you don't hurry, the rain will stop you. <laughs> So far over this series, we've been exploring the many little ways in which God works. It's been fascinating. We, we, we looked at the little tent. We saw how God works through a little tent. We looked at a little oil. That was powerful to understand the way God will just use a little. Last week, my wife preached about the little sling. That was potent, powerful, velvet, hammer, full octane stuff. And today I wanna speak to you from a subject called a little cloud. A little cloud. You ready for the Word of God? Come on, with anticipation, find 10 people around you. Fist bump them, elbow bump them. Get yourselves ready for the Word of God because it is coming. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Amen, 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 amen. It's coming. A little cloud. How many people have heard the, the term before, when it rains, it pours? You understand what I'm talking about. That's not an Australian thing. That, that works in America too. When it rains, it pours. I found that to be literal, living out on the ranch now. Ranch life. Well, I call it a ranch. I don't know what constitutes a ranch. Probably some cattle, but we don't have any of that. However, uh, we, we, we live way out. So that constitutes to me a ranch. And, uh, you know, for 11 months, we really had no rain on the ranch. And so everything was so dry and dead, it was crazy. But then in one month, we got all that rain and we went from like dry and dead, barren land to literally floods. It was crazy. Like everything's flooding. It was like there's no middle ground. When it rains, it, it pours. That's, that's the literal sense. But in the metaphorical sense, it's way worse in your life. You know, when things just seem to come out of nowhere and happen all at once. Like the other day, uh, my, my microwave uh, just decided it wasn't going to work and I don't like to waste money. I don't want, didn't want to call a, you know, a fix-it man. Uh, I'm that guy. It's my house, my kingdom. If there's a problem, I'll deal with it, you know. And so I literally proceeded to pull the whole microwave out of the wall and, and uh, just go to town. I'm going to fix this problem, whatever it is. It can't be that hard. You know, it's a microwave, you know. And so, however, I, I, got, I got a little stumped right at the beginning because there were these special screws that you needed a special screwdriver to unlock this thing, to take the cover off. I didn't have that. I wasn't about to go down the hardware store and find which screw. I was gonna jerry-rig this. So I got my pliers and I started to clench the screw and just undo it manually. And it was working too, don't worry. It was working until the, the pliers slipped off the screw and clenched onto my finger. 
like you can see my finger right now. It's black. It's black. Uh, I was going to get an image to put on the screen, but it's so big you can see it from there. It is, it's literally black all the way around. And this was crazy because not just that happened. As soon as that happened, man, the pain was insane. It was crazy. I didn't even know what I was doing. I just started to run. Ever been in that much pain? Where it's like, still don't work. You got to move. So I just started to run. I'm running around the kitchen. Kira's cooking dinner. I'm fixing a microwave. And I'm running. I'm like, help, do something, do something. And I ran and I'm like, okay, cold water. So I go and put on the faucet and I put my finger under. I'm like, it's not working because it's hot water. And I put on the cold water. I'm like, get ice. I'm screaming orders. I'm moving stuff. I'm dropping things. I'm actually pushing the microwave off the desk. I'm like, this is crazy. And out of nowhere, I'm grimacing with pain. I'm holding my finger as if to isolate the issue. And as I've got my eyes closed out of nowhere, my wife slapped me in the face. I'm not lying, she's right here. Like no little tap, like a slap. I opened my eyes with shock. I was like, ow, why? She's like, I saw it in a movie once. Thought it would work. But we went from like a zero to slap in the face in like five seconds flat. It happened all at once. When it rains, it, it pours. This is what we've got here in this passage, believe it or not. We've got a whole story that centers around rain. And in most instances throughout the Bible, you're actually going to find that the idea of rain and the indication of rain is, is very prominent and powerful. And most of the time it's directly connected to either the provision of God all directly represents the hand of God and His blessing on somebody's life. In fact, rain is even referred to the overflow of heaven and something that God sends upon those whom who He wants to show His abundant favour. Rain in the Bible often represents revival. Like, like the God will send revival in the form of rain which indicates that a dry and barren land that has rain upon it brings new life. Same with our dry and calloused heart, that when the Spirit of God comes upon it, like oil, it can soften the most calloused and hardened thing. You know, we've learned over the last couple of weeks that God can do a lot with a little. One of the confronting things is there are some things that God can't do, like He cannot lie. (laughs) He cannot not achieve what His Word sets out to do. But God also cannot work with a hardened heart. Like there is so much God can do, but when your heart is hardened and callous, God can't do nothing there. There's like nothing He can do with that. That, that. That's up to you. And so the idea of rain speaks to the idea of revival that comes and softens even the most dry, lifeless, barren situations. However, rain doesn't just represent revival. It can represent a reset. This was the case with Noah, where it rained for 40 days and 40 nights and flooded the earth, and that was God's way of redeeming what had gone wrong in creation. And so in this passage, we have a setting that also centers around rain. And don't get me wrong. Well, it does involve rain. I'm referring more to the sovereign power of God (laughs) that is represented in His power and His Lordship. The the R-E-I-G-N, rain, the, the rule and reign, the kingdom of God that we see this passage center actually around. You see, we've been exploring the infinite power of God over this series, and biblically, God's infinite power is most dynamically represented in what's called His sovereignty. Now, if you're unfamiliar with this particular word, allow me to reveal what it means, because God's sovereignty simply explains how He is superior. (laughs) I love that word. He's greater, far better. He's better than the best, that is God. There is nothing like Him. Not anything can match. There is nothing else that compares to God because He is sovereign over all things. This is why God is known as the King of kings and the Lord of lords because He has no equal and there are no limitations to Him. In fact, the Hebrew name that you'll find for God in the Old Testament is the word Yahweh, which literally means I am. And the reason that is the correlation or the indication or the name they gave to God or God gave to Himself is is because there's nothing that God can compare Himself to other than Himself. The greatest articulation of explanation of God is I am, all on His own, without any support, without anybody else. He existed before the world. He was present when the world, before the world was formed. It was Him in Himself. So I am is the only way that you can actually articulate God. 
He's incomparable. Nothing is on the scale. He's in a league or on his own. And so what you need to do when understanding God's sovereignty is that God's sovereignty produces a deep sense of security in the believer because it ultimately speaks about his control over both the natural and the supernatural elements. And as we've already discovered over this series is that God is all powerful. He's all knowing and he's everywhere at once. But not only that, he has a plan for every single possible scenario in your world. This is what gives the believer so much confidence that even in the midst of your mistakes, God's got a plan for that. Even when you call it, I I went off the track, God's got a plan for that. God's got a scope and an idea and even an imagination that can picture any possible scenario. He's already paid the price for it and he's redeemed it in advance so that he has a plan in his sovereignty to make sure that his will is able to get done through your life if you're willing. If you're willing. You need some scripture to back this up. Ephesians 1.11, get this. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, We have received an inheritance from God. He chose us in advance and he makes everything work out according to his plan. Oh, you need more evidence? Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. This is good news. This is great Bible teaching. I don't know why you're not getting excited in your seat. It's not time to be Presbyterian on me. Let's go Pentecostal for a moment. Let's go full Pentecostal mode just for a moment. Because I'm preaching the unadulterated word of God. This is the understanding that God reigns supreme in your life. He is sovereign in your life. That doesn't matter how awry you've gone, God's got a plan for that. God's, God's able. He's able to handle it. His sovereignty also includes the means by which he creates and, and rules the, the world and the universe. That's so cool. Paul reveals this to the Colossians in his letter where he writes to them in Colossians 1.16 for by him, check this out, All things were created, talking about his sovereignty, things in heaven and on earth, things that are visible and invisible. I like that so much. Like it's not just the things that you can see, there's things that you can't see that God's working together for your plan. You thought he was just working through the obvious. God's got unobvious, invisible ways in which he can pull things together. Maybe it's not even in the time frame that you thought. Maybe it's not even in the realm that you thought. You were stuck in the natural realm with the natural provision and the natural thing. You're looking at your job and your income statement. You're looking at what you've got around you. God's like, I'm in the supernatural realm. I can pull from all kinds of resources to bring a breakthrough one moment that you need it. You can't see it, but I got it. The, the, the invisible... The visible and the invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by Him and for Him. For He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. <laughs> He's central. And He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything, in everything, He might have the supremacy. The supremacy. I love that word. The supr- He's supreme. God reigns supreme over all things. He's unequaled. He is unmatched. This is our God. This is the kind of reign, R-E-I-G-N, this story with Elijah really centers around that is displayed in the form of pending reign. It's a reigning over all things at all times, the way a king rules everything within his kingdom. This means that nothing happens within the universe that is outside of God's permission. That's a confronting thought. Because God is sovereign, he has power to prevent Anything from happening at any moment he wishes. Did you know that? In other words, it's never too late for God. It's never too late for God to intervene. And whenever he acts, it's actually the perfect time to produce what is in line with his will. Uh, I don't know if I'm getting too fast for you. I'm trying to make sure I do some deep theological teaching and get you understanding the way that God reigns supreme. He is sovereign. That means nothing is too late for God. You thought it was too late. But God's timing is perfect to work it in line with what he wants to produce. Now, while this is a comforting thought as an aspect of God's sovereignty, there's a confronting aspect to it also because everything that does happen in life must at least be allowed by God to happen. This, this includes 
the things that seem to work against you, the things that impact us negatively. And knowing God can intervene is one thing, but understand why He doesn't, that's confusing. Like if God can intervene, why don't He? And, and, and if God is able because He's sovereign, like there's nothing outside of His power and yet, and His timing works perfect, He can intervene at any moment, then, then, then why doesn't He work to my plan? <laughs> because what I consider to be perfect was a long time ago, God, and still, still here I am. Like some of you are like, God, the perfect time for a husband would have been like 25, 26, you know, when, when, when metabolism was still a thing and you were your best version of yourself. And God, now I'm 36, what's going on? Where's this perfect timing? God, see, that's, that's confusing because everything that does happen must at least be allowed by God. Like if God is sovereign, why do I still have problems? That's my confusion. In fact, maybe, maybe this whole setting could actually show us exactly how the sovereignty of God works because it actually starts with a peculiar sentence in verse 41. I don't know if you got this or not, but... It starts with Elijah saying to Ahab, go get something to eat and drink, for I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. Now, now you may recall back a few weeks where, where we came around the story of Elijah with a widow with a little oil. A little oil, just a little oil. That There was a little oil that was happening, and, and all she had was a little oil because she was in a famine. She was in a famine that was caused by a drought, that God was really kind of leaning into revealing to Ahab, who was the king at that time, his sovereign power over the elements. And as a byproduct of that drought, the famine, we have this widow who God was going to use to be the provision for his prophet Elijah. But upon the prophet Elijah and the timing that he came, she only had a little oil left and one last meal. This is the same drought that we're seeing now where in the same drought as an effect some years later, there's some things that have happened in the meantime. Well, obviously, there's some, some, some years have gone past, but now we've got Elijah telling Ahab that rain is coming. He says, go and get something to eat and drink because I hear a sound. A sound that no one has heard for years. A sound that carried across the desert, and dare I say one that carried beyond natural realms because it was a sound that wasn't supported by any sight. You see, something caught the, the ear of Elijah that not only created hope, but it carried expectation. It says the, he heard the sound of a mighty rainstorm coming, and before he saw the evidence of it, I love this, he says to Ahab, go and eat and drink. It's a strange instruction. Like get an umbrella, that might suit. But go and eat and drink. And it had me confused for the longest time until I realized that, that, that this is the power of acting upon expectation. This is what the prophet is doing. He's acting upon expectation. Now, now you got to understand they were in a, a drought. You see, after several years of drought, and rationing of food, the entire kingdom would have been in a conservation mode. Even the king at this point would have been storing up whatever he had so that it would last as long as possible. However, Elijah responds to the sound of rain and he acts on the expectation and says, whatever you've been storing, go and eat. Drought done. On the sound of rain. On the sound of expectation, this is a powerful faith perspective right here that when you have the sound of something, will you act? You see, this is what faith sounds like, in fact. Faith hears something before it sees something. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 reveals this. We walk by faith and not by sight. In fact, faith is the medium that connects what we hope for with the things we don't yet see. Faith is the medium the translator effect, the connector between the things we hope for and the things that we don't yet see. And did you know sound, sound is a sense? That's what sound is. One of the senses. And sound is a sense. It's a sense. It's a sense that God's doing something. A sense that God's speaking. In fact, that's the way God speaks is often through a sense. Did you know that? It can be confusing to people trying to hear the voice of God and wondering what does God's voice sound like, like as if it's an audible or it's going to come through a radio. No, 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 no. It's just a sense. It's a sense. 
And I get a strong sense that God's speaking. I get a strong sense that God is leading. I get a strong sense that God is doing something. And what's interesting is that before they could see the evidence of, of rain, Elijah was willing to act on the sense that God was up to something. Oh, don't miss this. This is so good. This is the way God speaks to us. Let me ask a question. Have you ever had the sense that God's up to something? Have you ever had the sense that God has more for your life? Sometimes it's actually confronting to admit because we don't want to feel like uh, I'm going to project something. But if it's just you, you've got this deep sense that God's got something in store. Like God's got something significant. That's why you work so hard. That's why you, 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 you skill yourself up. That's why you're doing what you're doing because you've got this deep sense. I don't know why. I don't know where, but I don't know when. But I know that God's got something. It's a sense. It's a sense. It's a sense you can't shake. And it's confusing because you know it's significant, but I can't see it. I can't see it. Well, what if God will create a sense of expectation so that you will start to act on it? This is how revival works, by the way. Vision works in revival. This is where vision comes from, is that a sense that God's doing something. It's funny when we talk about vision, vision has nothing to do with sight. It has everything to do with sound. <laughs> that you will hear a word from God and you'll actually cast a vision. This is why at Vive Church, we had the sense that, 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 that God is going to actually bring revival in the Bay Area. So we started this thing called the Hope Truck, where we are believing that the, the church is going to be the hope of the world. We better have a practical answer for the move of God. And so we're going to move out into our community. This is why we start Help Online, because we see with a pandemic that the only solution to a pandemic is the hope of Jesus Christ. And the mental issues that are going to arise out of this season are going to need some real practical help. So we step out by faith and we do an online Help Online uh, uh, area. And then now also, this is why we buy a building, by the way. Not because we can afford it. You don't wait until you can afford things. You move on the sense. I got a sense that there are going to be thousands of people filling the house of God. We better step by faith and make some space to contain the move of God. We have a sense and we're going to act on the sense. It's a deep sense that God's going to do something significant. If you wait for till you see it, it's too long. You miss it. You miss it. This is why he told Ahab, you better go, or otherwise the rain will stop you. If you wait till you see it, the things that you're waiting to see prevent you. You gotta act on the on the sense. Now, despite Elijah's sense, they still don't see it. This is what's confusing in our life. I mean, how many people know that nothing tests your faith like sensing something but not seeing it? And so Elijah does something pretty profound. He sends his servant to see. <laughs> he gets the sense. He tells Ahab, go eat and drink. It's happening. It's coming. But then he sends the servant to see. Now, do not get this confused. This is not a lack of faith. This is simply the next step to a sense. This is what you should do when you have a deep sense. You should expect to see something. You should expect, not just I sense it, but I'm going to wait until I see. No, no, I have a sense. I'm going to see. Go and look. And he sends the servant to immediately go and see what he's sensing. He says, I sense the sound of a mighty rainstorm. I, I, I sense it. I heard the sound, a mighty rainstorm. I sense that God is going to do something significant on my life, but I need you to go and see because all I see right now, I, and maybe this is you, maybe you sense God got something significant, but all you see is you're serving. <laughs> maybe there's some things that you, you're sensing, but you're not, you're not seeing it. You know, when we started this church, we had a deep sense that God was going to do something significant. I mean, you don't move countries and pull your kids out of everything just at the little, no, no, it's a deep sense. That God's going to do something, but then I hope to see something. <laughs> it was actually confusing to begin with. When we first started the church, it was actually embarrassing how small this thing was. <laughs> like real embarrassing. Especially when you're telling you know, everyone back home how well it's going. Oh, you move countries for four people. Okay. And But we had the sense. It started so small. Started in our living room with a prayer meeting. We had a couple of friends we'd met online and connected with, and, and then we had a neighbor, so we invited her. This was an amazing story. She came along and 
She, she, she said uh, she had an old Catholic background and she didn't understand uh, like how rowdy we were because we, were, we had revival prayer. Man, come on, it was four of us, but we were praying like it was a 400, you know. So, so we're praying and we're tearing the walls down and we're breaking demonic strongholds over the city and we're praying about this church. And afterwards, she's like, where is this church? I'm like, well, it's prophetic. <laughs> it's coming. It's coming. And she was so dull. She's like, I want to be in. We said, yes, now we've got five members. This is great. And so what we did in those days, we just put you in prominent positions. Like if, when we had five people, you could have preached. It was, it was easy, you know. <laughs> and she really had no church experience, but she was lovely. So we said, let's put you on the door, like the greedy. You can be the first impression team. It was confusing why the people that had registered to come to our previous services weren't actually coming to service. I was so confused for weeks. So I thought I would inspect, I would go out and help bolster the First Impressions team only to find our lovely uh, Catholic neighbour greeting everyone with, bless you, my child, doing bless you, blessing everybody. And I'm like, what are you doing? Freaking everyone out. People were coming and like, not the church for me. <laughs> but we had a sense, which didn't see. We had a sense, but we didn't, we didn't, we didn't see, we didn't see, we didn't see. Can I inform you that every significant thing God does starts as a seed? Sometimes we simply need to adjust what we're looking for. Oh. See, Elijah sends his servant to see, but, but six times he didn't see anything. Six times he didn't. He didn't see anything. He sent his servants. So, so, so Elijah hears the sound. It's not just a, it's not pitter patter. He hears a mighty rainstorm. Like this is a deafening sound. This is a distinct sense. The rain is coming. He actions Ahab, go and eat and drink. The rain's coming. He, he hears it. Then he sends his servant to see. comes back and here's Elijah. How is it? How is it? How's the rain? He, he hears the rain. He's like, man, it must be big. And the, and the servant's like, I don't, I don't really see anything, Elijah. I don't know if Elijah's getting confused. I, I don't think he is because he can hear the rain. He's like, you must be blind. Man, there is, there, you can, I can hear, I hear the sound of a mighty rainstorm, a mighty rainstorm. He's hearing thunder. He's hearing lightning. He's hearing, he's hearing stuff. But then every time the servant goes to see, he He doesn't see it. He doesn't see it. Seven times, on the seventh time, and I don't know how the Bible actually is meant to be translated. I don't know if every time he went to look, he didn't see anything, or if each time he actually saw something, because he says, on the seventh time, he says, I, I mean, I, I see just a little cloud. Like it's subtle, like it's like barely the size of a man's hand. And, and, and I don't know if that was the first time he saw it or it was there all along, but it just wasn't what Elijah said he heard. Because he was expecting to hear or see a mighty rainstorm, but what he actually saw didn't look like what he expected. Maybe we're gonna change what it is we're looking for. Because we see and believe that God has said something significant for our life. So what we're looking for isn't what we expected. But what if we change what we're looking for so that we see something unexpected? Maybe God wants to work through some unexpected ways. And so the, on the seventh time, the, the servant comes back, probably a little frustrated. Man, Elijah has lost it because he's hearing something that I'm not seeing. He's talking about a mighty rainstorm. He's, talk, he's telling the king to run. He's, he's actioning things. All I see is just something real subtle. Comes back and reports is, I mean, there's, there's a little cloud. There's a little... It's so, it's so subtle. I thought God was doing something significant. And Elijah, upon hearing, he sees a little cloud. He says, that's it, run. 
run. You see, he knew exactly what to expect. The servant was trying to connect the, what he saw with what he heard. He heard significance, but what he saw, it was, was subtle. What, what if I was to tell you that everything God does that's significant always starts subtle? What if I'm gonna tell you emphatically that everything God does starts as a seed? Everything God does, what you consider little, God says it ain't little, it's subtle. It's subtle. It's subtle. Like God is, like this whole entire time, you haven't even seen that this whole display has turned to a storm because it happens subtly. It happens, it's right in front of your face, but you don't even see it. It's happening all along, but you're not looking at it. Your vision's on the wrong thing. You're missing the way God wants to work. It started as a bunch of pots and slings and oil and tents. And before you realise that there's a storm that God is causing, He's bringing everything, but it's subtle. It's subtle, it's subtle, it's subtle. It's so subtle. It's so subtle. Subtle, subtle, subtle. Maybe you're waiting on God to change your current setting, but He's been trying to use your current setting to change you. Maybe maybe you've been hoping that God would bring a wife, but He's been trying to make you into a husband. It's not what you thought to see. It's significant, but it's subtle requires a perspective shift to change what you're looking for. In fact, we've been drawing a connection over this series between the infinite and the finite that even though what we have seemed small, we know God's in it. So in the same way, what if the most significant things God does in and through your life happen way more subtly than you expect? Actually, let me go even as far to say the most significant things God does in your life, He does it subtly. I'll I'll prove it to you. We see this with the birth of Jesus, that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords comes as a baby in a manger, that's subtle. We see it with Moses. God's plan to deliver the Israelites out of Pharaoh's hand happened years earlier by putting Moses in a bassinet, sending him down the river so that he would be collected by the princess, grow up in the palace and he would do it subtly. We see with Joseph, Joseph with God's designed man to be the prime minister at the right time, but the pathway to prime ministership was through a pit, was through a prison, was a servant in a palace, that's subtle. We even see it with Paul, the Apostle. He was God's chosen instrument to bring the Gospel, the good news to the Gentiles, but he was a Christian killer at the time. That's not subtle, that's sneaky. And dare I say, it's God's plan for the church today to not use prominent, powerful preachers, but to use the people of God with their gifts coming in surrender. Wouldn't that be nice? We expect the significant thing God's gonna do is gonna come with someone with millions of followers. They can send one tweet out and hordes of people turn up. No, no, it's gonna be through you and your neighbours and your co-workers and you just being the light of the good news, doing it subtly, doing it in significant ways, but subtly not just filling stadiums overnight, but you being diligent with what you've got and the ground that God has given you and you water it and you say, God, I'm ready for you to do something significant, even as through subtle little old me, being a candidate, seeing it different. I get the sense God's gonna do something, but don't miss the way He's gonna do it. Would you stand to your feet? I'm out of time. I need to do some ministry because I really feel that God wants to open some eyes today. I believe God wants to open some eyes and illuminate what you've been missing this whole time. Because you thought God hasn't been working. You thought God might have stalled in your life. You might have thought that God has been, you've been stuck, like, like where is God? And God's been working the whole time. You just haven't seen it. You've been looking for the wrong thing. You've been expecting the wrong thing, but God's like, I've been working in your family. I've been working on your heart. And it's subtle. Don't get me wrong, it's significant. But when you begin to get the eyes open to see the way God works, it's amazing to see that God's been working. You see, vision works perfect in reflection. That's why they say hindsight's 20-20, because when you look back over your life, you can connect the dots and 
You can see how God was using that situation and I thought He was late to the party, but it was actually perfect timing because it made the connection to here, to here, to here and where I am, I wouldn't change anything. And you can perfectly look how God was bringing things together. That's evident. But the trick is to walk by faith, not by sight. And how do I see the subtle ways God's moving? How can I trade up what I expect to see and identify the unexpected ways that God wants to work in my life? I see a little, little cloud. I got a little business, I got a little family, I got a little. We often overlook the little because we're trying to see the significant. I firmly believe in this series, God is trying to get our focus squarely on the little that we've got and saying, that's exactly what I'm looking to use. That's exactly the avenue. The God of the universe wants to funnel His power through. It requires us to open our eyes and begin to see. And I believe God wants to do that today. Would you do something right here? Would you close your eyes and bow your heads? Because I believe that God is gonna give some spiritual sight. I firmly believe that God is gonna open some eyes. The Bible makes it clear. Jesus, in fact, said that the eyes of those who don't believe are blinded. They cannot see if they try to. And when you come into the light, it's like scales fall off your eyes. All of a sudden you can see the ways that God's moving. You can begin to connect dots. You can begin to see it. And it's been there the whole time. You just haven't been able to see it. But I believe God is gonna illuminate some things for some people. That you're gonna walk out of this place with fresh vision. You're gonna walk out of this place with fresh perspective. Some of you have overlooked your marriage, but your marriage, Marriage has been the key component that God has been building in your life for power, for influence and for prominence. But you've been overlooking it, seeing what you don't got. God's gonna open your eyes to see what you do have in the very midst, to see God's blessing like you've never seen it before. You thought it was gonna come from somewhere else. God's like, I'm already working it. You're just not seeing it. You're just not seeing it. So God, I pray right now. In fact, if you want God to open your eyes, lift your hands, lift your hands. I'm gonna pray this prayer that God's gonna give spiritual sight. God, you see every hand, every palm that is open. God, we pray for an illumination. Illuminate it, illuminate. Lord, let them see it. Lord, let them see it. The sense, the sense that we have, that you are stirring something that You are causing something, that You are colliding something. God, would we see it in our day, not just see it in reflection, not just look back and see how good that was what God did, but we can see what You're doing as You're doing it, that we can be the people of God to respond, to be a part of the plan and the purpose of heaven. God, I pray for eyes to open, spirits to be open, ears to open, that we would hear and see what it is the Word of the Lord is doing in our day as your servants. In fact, while every head's bowed, every eye closed, we're talking about spiritual sight. This is what it means to step into relationship with Jesus, to see the light, the light of God's good news, His grace and His favour toward you. And I firmly believe in my spirit that the Holy Spirit wants to reveal Himself to you today. I don't know where you're at with God. I don't know if you've ever prayed a prayer to receive Jesus as your Lord and Saviour. Or maybe you have one time, but you realise that the light's gone dim. I've walked my own way and I need to come back to God. Then I'm gonna tell you, I wanna pray for you today. I wanna empower you today to make Jesus your Lord, to refresh your vision, to put Him as the perspective, to set your eyes on Jesus today. So if you're here and you're acknowledging, I need that prayer, Pastor, pray for me. While every head's bowed, every eye closed. If you're saying, yes, pray for me, just right where you are, give me a wave so I know who this prayer is for. Just give me a wave. Yeah, 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 yeah. Who else? Yes, 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 yes. Who else? Who else? Give me a wave so I can see it up the back, in the middle, down the front. Yes, over on the side, I see that. Anybody else? Yes. Anybody else? Yes. Online, other campuses, you can wave your hand as well. We're gonna pray and this is gonna be a pivotal moment in your life where you're gonna go from limited vision to unlimited perspective of the power of heaven in and through your life. That God's gonna begin to reveal some things that you've been missing. They've been there, but you've been missing it. He's been working, but you just haven't seen it. Anybody else? I wanna pray for you. I wanna pray for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My goodness, God, You see every single life today, every person acknowledging they need You. God, they wanna see, not just see what You're doing, but I believe see how You see them, to see from Your vantage point. We often see ourselves as hopeless or done, but God, we wanna see what You see. 
So God, I pray that you would open eyes right now.